Burning Bright by Ron Rash After the third fire in two weeks, the talk on TV and radio was no longer about careless campers. Not three fires. Nothing short of a miracle that only a few acres had been burned. The park superintendent said a miracle less likely to occur again with each additional rainless day. Marcy listened to the Manoon weather forecast, then turned off the TV and went out on the porch. She looked at the sky, and nothing bellied the prediction of more hot, dry weather. The worst drought in a decade, the weatherman had said, showing a ten-year chart of August rainfalls. As if Marcy needed a chart when all she had to do was look at her tomatoes shriveled on the vines, the corn shucks gray and papery as a hornet's nest. She stepped off the porch and dragged a length of hose into the garden, its rubber sole bright green among the rows. Marcy turned on the water and watched it splatter against the dust. Hopeless, but she slowly walked the rows, grasping the hose just below the metal mouth as if it were a snake that could bite her. When she finished, she looked at the sky a last time and went inside. She thought of Carl, wondering if he'd be late again. She thought about the cigarette lighter he carried in his front pocket, a wedding gift she'd bought him in Catlinburg. When her first husband, Arthur, had died two falls earlier of a heart attack, the man in the church had come to the following week and fellowed a white oak on the ridge. They'd cut into firewood and stacked it on her porch. Their doing so had been more an act of homage to Arthur than of concern for her, or so Marcy realized the following September when the men did not come, making it clear that the church and the community it represented believed others needed their help more than a woman whose husband had left behind 50 acres of land, a paid-off house, and money in the bank. Carl showed up instead. Heard you might need some firewood cut, he told her. But she did not unlatch the screen door when he stepped onto the porch, even after he explained that Preacher Carter had suggested he come. He stepped back to the porch edge, his deep blue eyes lowered so as not to meet hers. Trying to set her at ease, she was sure, appear less threatening to a woman living alone. It was something a lot of other men wouldn't have done, wouldn't even have thought to do. Marcy asked for a phone number, and Carl gave her one. I'll call you tomorrow if I need you, she said, and watched him drive off in his battered black pickup, a chainsaw and red five-gallon gas can rattling in the truck bed. She phoned Preacher Carter after Carl left. He's new in the area from down near the coast, the minister told Marcy. He came by the church one afternoon, claimed he'd do good work for fair wages. So you sent him up here not knowing hardly anything about him? Marcy asked. With me living alone? Ozel Harper wanted some trees cut and I sent him out there, Preacher Carter said. He also cut some trees for Andy West. They both said he did a cracker job job. The minister paused. I think the fact he came by the church to ask about work speaks in his favor. He's got a good demeanor about him, too. Serious and soft-spoken. Let's his work do the talking for him. She called Carl that night and told him he was hired. Marcy cut off the spigot and looked at the sky one last time. She went inside and made her shopping list. As she drove down the half-mile dirt road, red dust rose in the car's wake. She passed the other houses on the road, both owned by Floridians who came every year in June and left in September. When they moved in, she'd walk down the road with a homemade pie. The newcomers had stood in their doorways. They accepted the welcoming gift with a seeming reluctance and did not invite her in. Marcy turned left onto the blacktop, the radio on the local station. She went by several fields of corn and tobacco, every bit as singed as her own garden. 
Before long, she passed Johnny Ramsey's farm and saw several of the cows that had been in her pasture until Arthur died. The road forked, and as Marcy passed Holcomb Prude's place, she saw a black snake draped over a barbed wire fence, put there because the older farmers believed it would bring rain. Her father had called it a silly superstition when she was a child, but during a drought nearly as bad as this one, her father had killed the black snake himself and placed it on the fence, then fallen to his knees in his scorched cornfield imploring whatever entity would listen to bring rain. Marcy hadn't been listening to the radio, but now a psychology teacher from the community college was being interviewed on a call-in show. The man said the person setting the fires was, according to the statistics, a male and a loner. Sometimes there's a sexual gratification in the act, he explained, or an inability to communicate with others except in actions in this case, destructive actions, or just a love of watching fire itself, an almost aesthetic response. But arsonists are always obsessive, the teacher concluded, so he won't stop until he's caught or the rain comes. The thought came to her, then like something held underwater that had finally slipped free and surfaced. The only reason you're thinking it could be him, Marcy told herself, is because people have made you believe you don't deserve him, don't deserve a little happiness. There's no reason to think such a thing, but just as quickly her mind grasped for one. Marcy thought of the one-night honeymoon in Gatlinburg back in April. She and Carl had stayed in a hotel room so close to a stream that they could hear the water rushing past. The next morning, they'd eaten at a pancake house and then walked around the town, looking in the shops, Marcy holding Carl's hand. Foolish, maybe, for a woman of almost sixty, but Carl hadn't seemed to mind. Marcy told him she wanted to buy him something, and when they came to a shop called Country Gents, she let him into its log cabin interior. You pick, she told Carl and he gazed into glass cases holding all manner of belt buckles and pocket knives and cufflinks, but it was a tray of cigarette lighters where he lingered. He asked the clerk to see several, opening and closing their hinged lids, flicking the thumbway to summon the flame, finally settling on one whose metal bore the image of a cloison tiger. At the grocery store, Marcy took out her list and an ink pen moving down the rows. Monday afternoon was a good time to shop, most of the women she knew coming later in the week. Her shopping cart filled. Marcy came to the front. Only one line was open, and it was Barbara Hardison's, a woman Marcy's age, and the biggest gossip in Silva. How were your girls? Barbara asked as she scanned a can of beans and placed it on the conveyor belt. Done slowly, Marcy knew giving Barbara more time. Fine, Marcy said, though she'd spoken to neither in over a month. Must be hard to have them living so far away, not hardly see them or your grandkids. I don't know what to do if I didn't see mine at least once a week. We talk every Saturday, so I keep up with them, Marcy lied. Barbara scanned more cans and bottles, all the while talking about how she believed the person responsible for the fires was one of the Mexicans working at the poultry plant. No one knew, no one who grew up around here would do such a thing, Barbara said. Marcy nodded, barely listening as Barbara prattled on. Instead, her mind replayed what the psychology teacher said. She thought about how there were days when Carl spoke no more than a handful of words to her, to anyone as far as she knew, and how he'd sit alone on the porch until bedtime while she watched TV, and how, though he'd smoked his, his after-supper cigarette, she'd look out the front window and sometimes see a flicker of lights rise out of his cupped hand, held before his face like a guiding candle. The cart was almost empty when Barbara pressed a bottle of hair dye against the scanner. Must be worrisome sometimes to have a husband strong and as strapping as Carl. 
Barbara said, loud enough so the bag boy heard. My boy Ethan says him over at Burroughs after work sometimes. Ethan says that girl who works the bear tries to flirt with Carl something awful. Of course, Ethan says Carl never flirts back, just sits there by himself and drinks his one beer and leaves soon as his bottle's empty. Barbara finally set the hair dye on the conveyor. Never pays that girl the least bit of mind, she added, and paused. At least when Ethan's been there. Barbara rang up the total and placed Marcy's check in the register. You have a good afternoon, Barbara said. On the way back home, Marcy remembered how after the wood had been cut and stacked, she'd hired Carl to do other jobs, repairing the sagging porch, then building a small garage, things Arthur would have done, if still alive. She'd peek out the window and watch him, admiring the way he worked with such a fixed attentiveness. Carl never seemed bored or distracted. He didn't bring a radio to help pass the time. And he smoked only after a meal, hand-rolling his cigarette with the same meticulous patience as when he measured a cut or stacked a cord of firewood. She envied how comfortable he was in his solitude. Their courtship had begun with cups of coffee, then offers of acceptances of home-cooked meals. Carl didn't reveal much about himself, but as the days and the weeks passed, Marcy learned he'd grown up in Whiteville, in the far east of the state. A carpenter who'd gotten laid off when the housing market went bad, he'd heard there was wo more work in the mountains, so he had come west all he cared to bring with him in the back of his pickup. When Marcy asked if he had children, Carl told her he'd never been married. Never found a woman who would have me, he said. Too quiet, I reckon. Not for me, she told him and smiled. Too bad I'm nearly old enough to be your mother. You're not too old, he replied. In a matter-of-fact way his blue eyes looking at her as he spoke not smiling she expected him to be a shy awkward lover but he wasn't the same attentiveness he showed in his work was in his kisses and touches in the way he matched the rhythms of his movements to hers it was as though his long silences made him better able to communicate in other ways nothing like author who had been brief and concerned mainly with satisfying himself Carl had lived in a run-down motel outside Silva that rented by the hour or the week, but they never went there. They always made love in Marcy's bed. Sometimes he'd stay the whole night. At the grocery store and church, there were asides and stairs. Preacher Carter, who'd sent Carl to her in her first place, spoke to Marcy of proper appearances. By then, her daughters had found out as well. From three states away, they spoke, uh, spoke to Marcy of being humiliated, insisting they'd be too embarrassed to visit, as if their coming home was a common occurrence. Marcy quit going to church and went into town as little as possible. Carl finished his work on the garage, but his reputation as a handyman was such that he had all the work he wanted, including an offer to join a construction crew working out of Silva. Carl told the crew boss he preferred to work alone. What people said to Carl about his and Marcy's relationships, she didn't know. But the night she brought it up, he told her they should get married. No formal proposal or candlelight dinner at a restaurant, just a flat statement. But good enough for her. When Marcy told her daughters, they were predictably outraged. The younger one cried. Why couldn't she act her age? Her older daughter asked, her voice scalding as a hot iron. A justice of peace married them, and then they, were, then they drove over the mountains to Gatlinburg for the weekend. Carl moved in what little he had, and they began a life together. She thought that the more comfortable they became around each other, the more they would talk, but that didn't happen. Evenings, Carl sat by himself on the porch or found some small chore to do. 
something best done alone. He didn't like to watch TV or rent movies. At supper, he'd always say it was a good meal. And thank her for making it. She might tell him something about her day and he'd listen politely, make a brief remark to show that though he said little, at least he was listening. But at night, as she readied herself for bed, he'd always come in. They'd lie down together and he'd turn to kiss her goodnight, always on the mouth. Three, four nights a week, they, that kiss would linger and then quilts and sheets would be pulled back. Afterward, Marcy would not put her nightgown back on. Instead, she'd press her back into his chest and stomach, bend her knees and fold herself inside him, his arms holding her close, his body's heat enclosing her. Once back home, Marcy put up the groceries and placed a chuck roast on the stove to simmer. She did a load of laundry and swept off the front porch, her eyes glancing toward the road for Carl's pickup. At six o'clock, she turned on the news. Another fire had been set, no more than 30 minutes earlier. Fortunately, a hiker was close by and saw the smoke, even glimpsed a pickup through the trees. No tag number or make. All the hiker knew for sure was that the pickup was black. Carl did not get home until almost seven. Marcy heard the truck coming up the road and began setting the table. Carl took off his boots on the porch and came inside. His face grimy with sweat, bits of sawdust in his hair and on his clothes. He nodded at her and went to the bathroom. As he showered, Marcy went out to the pickup. In the truck bed was a chainsaw. Beside it, plastic bottles of 28 engine oil and the red five-gallon gasoline can. When she lifted the can, it was empty. They ate in silence, except for Carl's usual compliment on the meal. Marcy watched him, waiting for a sign of something different in his demeanor, some glimpse of anxiety or satisfaction. There was another fire today, she finally said. I know, Carl answered, not looking up from his plate. She didn't ask how he knew when the radio in his truck didn't work, but he could have heard it at Burrell's as well. They say whoever said it drove a black pickup. Carl looked at her, his blue eyes clear and depthless. I know that too, he said. After supper, Carl sat on the porch while Marcy switched on the TV. She kept turning away from the movie she watched to look through the window. Carl sat in the wooden deck chair, only the back of his head and, vi and shoulders visible. Less so as the minutes passed and his body merged with the gathering dusk. He stared toward the high mountains of the Smokies and Marcy had no idea what, if anything, he was thinking about. He'd already smoked his cigarette, but she waited to see if he would take the lighter from his pocket, flick it, and stare at the flame a few moments. But he didn't. Not this night. When he, when she cut off the TV and went to the back room, the deck chair scraped as Carl pushed himself out of it. Then the click of metal as he locked the door. When he settled into the bed beside her, Marcy continued to lie with her back to him. He moved closer, placed his hand between her head and pillow, and slowly, gently turned her head so he could kiss her. As soon as his lips brushed hers, she turned away, moved so his body didn't touch hers. She fell asleep but woke a few hours later. Sometime in the night, she had resettled in the bed center, and Carl's arm now lay around her, his knees tucked behind her knees, his chest pressed against her back. As she lay awake, Marcy remembered the day her younger daughter left for Cincinnati, joining her sister there. I guess it's just us now, Arthur had said glumly. She resented those words as if Marcy were some grudgingly accepted consolation prize. She'd also resented how the words acknowledged that their daughters had always been closer to Arthur, even as children. In their teens, the girls had unleashed their rancor, the shouting and tears and grievances on Marcy. The inevitable conflicts between mothers and daughters and authors being the only male in the house 
that was surely part of it. But Marcy also believed there'd been some difference in temperature, temperament as innate as different blood types. Arthur had hoped that one day the novelty of city life would pale and the girls would come back to North Carolina. But the girls stayed up north and married and began their own families. Their visits and phone calls became less and less frequent. Arthur was hurt by that. Hurt deep, though never saying so. It seemed he aged more quickly, especially after he'd uh, had a stent placed in an artery. After that, Arthur did less around the farm. Until he finally had until finally he no longer grew tobacco or cabbage just raised a few cattle then one day he didn't come back for lunch she found him in the barn slumped beside a stall a hay hook in his hand the girls came home for the funeral and stayed three days after they left there was a month-long flurry of phone calls and visits and castles from people in the community and then days when the only vehicle that came was the mail truck. Marcy learned then what true loneliness was. Five miles from town on a dead-end dirt road, with not even the Floridians' houses in sight. She bought extra locks for the doors because at night she sometimes grew afraid, though what she feared was as much inside the house was outside it. Because she knew what was expected of her, to stay in this place, alone, waiting for the years, perhaps decades, to pass until she herself died. It was mid-morning the following day when Sheriff Beasley came. Marcy met him on the porch. The sheriff had been a close friend of Arthur's, and as he got out of the patrol car, he looked not at her, but at the sagging barn and empty pasture, seeming to ignore the house's new garage and freshly shingled roof. He didn't take off his hat as he crossed the yard or when he stepped onto the porch. I knew you'd sold some of Arthur's cows, but I didn't know it was all of them. The sheriff spoke as if it were intended only as an observation. Maybe I wouldn't have if there had been some men to help me with them after Arthur died. Marcy said, I couldn't do it by myself. I guess not, Sheriff Beasley replied, letting a few moments pass before he spoke again, his eyes on her now. I need to speak to Carl. You know where he's working today? Talk to him about what? Marcy asked. Who's ever setting these fires drives a black pickup. There's lots of black pickups in this county. Yes, there are, Sheriff Beasley said. And I'm checking out everybody who drives one, checking out where they were yesterday around six o'clock as well. I figured that to narrow it some. You don't need to ask Carl, Marcy said. He was here eating supper. At six o'clock? Around six, but he was here by 5.30. How are you so sure of that? The 5.30 news had just come on when he pulled up. The sheriff said nothing. You need me to sign something? I will, Marcy said. No, Marcy, that's not needed. I'm just checking off folks with black pickups. It's a long list. I bet you came here first, though, didn't you? Marcy said. Because Carl's not from around here. I came here first, but I had a cause, Sheriff Beasley said. When you and Carl started getting involved, Preacher Carter asked me to check up on him just to make sure he was on the up and up. I called the sheriff down there. Turns out that when Carl was 15, he and another boy got arrested for burning some woods behind a ball field. They claimed it an accident, but the judge didn't buy that. They almost got sent to juvenile detention. They've been boys do that kind of thing around here. Yes, there have the sheriff said. And that was the only thing in Carl's file, not even a speeding ticket. Still, his being here last evening when it happened, that's a good thing for him. Marcy waited for the sheriff to leave, but he lingered. He took out a soiled handkerchief and wiped his brow. 
probably wanting a glass of iced tea, she suspected, but she wasn't going to offer him one. The sheriff put up his handkerchief and glanced at the sky. You'd think we'd get we'd at least get an afternoon thunderstorm. I've got things to do, she said, and reached for the screen door handle. Marcy, the sheriff said, his voice so soft that she turned. He raised his right hand, palm open as if to offer her something, then let it fall. You're right. We should have done more for you after Arthur died. I regret that. Marcy opened the screen door and went inside. When Carl got home, she said nothing about the sheriff's visit. And that night in bed, when Carl turned and kissed her, Marcy met his lips and raised her hand to his neck. She pressed her free hand against the small of his back, guiding his body as it shifted, settled over her. Afterward, she lay awake, feeling Carl's breath on the back of her neck, his arms cinched around her ribs and stomach. She listened for a first far-off rumble, but there was only the dry, raspy sound of insects striking the window screen. Marcy had not been to church in months, had not prayed for even longer than that, but she did now. She shut her closed eyes tighter, trying to open a space inside herself that might offer up all of what she feared and hoped for, brought forth with such fervor it could not help but be heard. She prayed for rain.